Gentlemen and Players Old Raffles may or may not have been an exceptional criminal, but as a cricketer I dare swear he was unique. Himself a dangerous bat, a brilliant field, and perhaps the very finest slow bowler of his decade, he took incredibly little interest in the game at large. He never went up to Lord's without his cricket bag, or showed the slightest interest in the results of a match in which he was not himself engaged. Nor was this mere hateful egotism on his part. He professed to have lost all enthusiasm for the game, and to keep it up only from the very lowest motives. Cricket, said Raffles, like everything else is good enough sport until you discover a better. As a source of excitement, it isn't in it with other things you've wot of, Bunny, and the involuntary comparison becomes a bore. What's the satisfaction of taking a man's wicket when you want his spoons? Still, if you can bowl a bit, your low cunning won't get rusty. And always looking for the weak spots, just the kind of mental exercise one wants. Yes, perhaps there's some affinity between the two after all. But I'd chuck up cricket tomorrow, Bunny, if it wasn't for the glorious protection it affords a person of my proclivities. How so? said I. It brings you before the public, I should have thought, far more than is either safe or wise. My dear Bunny, that's exactly where you make a mistake. To follow crime with reasonable impunity, you simply must have a parallel, ostensible career. The more public, the better. The principle is obvious. Mr. Peace, of pious memory, disarmed suspicion by acquiring a local reputation for playing the fiddle and taming animals. It's my profound conviction that Jack the Ripper was really an eminent public man, whose speeches were very likely reported alongside his atrocities. Fill the bill in with some prominent part, and you'll never be suspected of doubling it with another of equal prominence. That's why I want you to cultivate journalism, my boy, and sign all you can. And it's the one and only reason why I don't burn my bats for firewood. Nevertheless, when he did play, there was no keener performer on the field, nor one more anxious to do well for his side. I remember how he went to the nets before the first match of the season, with his pockets full of sovereigns, which he put on the stumps instead of bales. It was a sight to see the professionals bowling like demons for the hard cash, and whenever a stump was hit a pound was tossed to the bowler and another balanced in its stead, while one man took three pounds with a ball that spread-eagled the wicket. Raffles' practice cost him either eight or nine sovereigns, but he had absolutely first-class bowling all the time, and he made fifty-seven runs next day. It became my pleasure to accompany him to all his matches, to watch every ball he bowled or played or fielded, and to sit chatting with him in the pavilion when he was doing none of these three things. You might have seen us there, side by side, during the greater part of the gentlemen's first innings against the players, who had lost the toss, on the second Monday in July. We were to be seen, but not heard, for Raffles had failed to score— and was uncommonly cross for a player who cared so little for the game. Merely taciturn with me, he was positively rude to more than one member who wanted to know how it had happened, or who ventured to commiserate with him on his luck. There he sat, with a straw hat tilted over his nose, and a cigarette stuck between lips that curled disagreeably at every advance. I was therefore much surprised when a young fellow of the same exquisite type came and squeezed himself in between us, and met with a perfectly civil reception despite the liberty. I did not know the boy by sight, nor did Raffles introduce us, but their conversation proclaimed at once a slightness of acquaintanceship and a license on the lad's part which combined to puzzle me. Mystification reached its height when Raffles was informed that the other's father was anxious to meet him, and he instantly consented to gratify that whim. "'He's in the ladies' enclosure. Will you come round now?' "'With pleasure,' says Raffles. "'Keep a place for me, Bunny.' And they were gone. "'Young Crowley,' said some voice further back. "'Last year's Harrow Eleven. 
I remember him, worst man in the team. Keen cricketer, however, stopped till he was twenty to get his colours. Governor made him, keen breed. Oh, pretty, sir, very pretty. The game was boring me. I only came to see old Raffles perform. Soon I was looking wistfully for his return, and at length I saw him beckoning me from the palings to the right. Want to introduce you to old Amersteth, he whispered when I joined him. They've a cricket week next month, when this boy Crowley comes of age, and we've both got to go down and play. Both, I echoed. But I'm no cricketer. Shut up, says Raffles. Leave that to me. I've been lying for all I'm worth, he added sepulchrally as we reached the bottom of the steps. I trust you not to give the show away. There was a gleam in his eye that I knew well enough elsewhere, but was unprepared for in those healthy, sane surroundings, and it was with very definite misgivings and surmises that I followed the Zingari blazer through the vast flower-bed of hats and bonnets that bloomed beneath the ladies' awning. Lord Amersteth was a fine-looking man, with a short moustache and a double chin. He received me with much dry courtesy, through which, however, it was not difficult to read a less flattering tale. I was accepted as the inevitable appendage of the invaluable Raffles, with whom I felt deeply incensed as I made my bow. "'I have been bold enough,' said Lord Amersteth, "'to ask one of the gentlemen of England to come down and play some rustic cricket for us next month. "'He is kind enough to say that he would have liked nothing better. "'But for this little fishing expedition of yours, Mr. Mr.' "'And Lord Amersteth succeeded in remembering my name. "'It was, of course, the first I had ever heard of that fishing expedition, "'but I made haste to say that it could easily and should certainly be put off. "'Raffles gleamed approval through his eyelashes.' Lord Amersteth bowed and shrugged. "'You're very good, I'm sure,' said he. "'But I understand you're a cricketer yourself.' "'He was one at school,' said Raffles with infamous readiness. "'Not a real cricketer,' I was stammering meanwhile. "'In the eleven? said Lord Amersteth. "'I'm afraid not,' said I. "'But only just out of it.' declared Raffles to my horror. "'Well, well, we can't all play for the gentlemen,' said Lord Amersteth slyly. "'My son Crowley only just scraped into the eleven at Harrow, and he's going to play. I may even come in myself at a pinch, so you won't be the only duffer, if you are one, and I shall be very glad if you'll come down and help us, too. You shall flog a stream before breakfast and after dinner, if you like.' I should be very proud, I was beginning, as the mere prelude to resolute excuses, but the eye of Raffles opened wide upon me, and I hesitated, weakly, to be duly lost. Then that's settled, said Lord Amersteth, with the slightest suspicion of grimness. It's to be a little weak, you know, when my son comes of age. We play the Free Foresters, the Dorsetshire Gentlemen, and probably some local lot as well. "'but Mr. Raffles will tell you all about it, and Crowley shall write. "'Another wicket! By Jove, they're all out! "'Then I rely on you both.' "'And with a little nod, Lord Amersteth rose and sidled to the gangway. "'Raffles rose also, but I caught the sleeve of his blazer. "'What are you thinking of?' I whispered savagely. "'I was nowhere near the eleven. I'm no sort of cricketer.' I shall have to get out of this. Not you, he whispered back. You needn't play, but come you must. If you wait for me after half-past six, I'll tell you why. But I could guess the reason, and I am ashamed to say that it revolted me much less than did the notion of making a public fool of myself on a cricket field. My gorge rose at this as it no longer rose at crime and it was in no tranquil humour that I strolled about the ground while Raffles disappeared in the pavilion. Nor was my annoyance lessened by a little meeting I witnessed between young Crowley and his father, who shrugged as he stopped and stooped to convey some information which made the young man look a little blank. It may have been pure self-consciousness on my part, 
but I could have sworn that the trouble was their inability to secure the great raffles without his insignificant friend. Then the bell rang, and I climbed to the top of the pavilion to watch Raffles bowl. No subtleties are lost up there, and if ever a bowler was full of them it was A.J. Raffles on this day, as indeed all the cricket world remembers. One had not to be a cricketer oneself to appreciate his perfect command of pitch and break, his beautifully easy action, which never varied with the varying pace, his great ball on the leg stump, his dropping head ball, in a word, the infinite ingenuity of that versatile attack. It was no mere exhibition of athletic prowess. It was an intellectual treat, and one with a special significance in my eyes. I saw the affinity between the two things. Saw it in that afternoon's tireless warfare against the flower of professional cricket. It was not that Raffles took many wickets for few runs. He was too fine a bowler to mind being hit. And time was short, and the wicket good. What I admired, and what I remember, was the combination of resource and cunning, of patience and precision, of headwork and handiwork which made every over an artistic whole. It was all so characteristic of that other Raffles whom I alone knew. I felt like bowling this afternoon, he told me later in the hansom. With a pitch to help me, I'd have done something big. As it is, three for forty-one, out of the four that fell, isn't so bad for a slow bowler on a plum wicket against those fellows but I felt venomous. Nothing riles me more than being asked about for my cricket as though I were a pro myself. Then why on earth go? To punish them. And because we shall be jolly hard up, Bunny, before the season's over. Ah, said I. I thought it was that. Of course it was. It seems they're going to have the very devil of a week of it. Balls, dinner parties, swagger house party, general junketings, and obviously a house full of diamonds as well. Diamonds galore. As a general rule, nothing would induce me to abuse my position as a guest. I've never done it, Bunny. But in this case, we're engaged like the waiters and the band, and by heaven we'll take our toll. Let's have a quiet dinner somewhere and talk it over. It seems a rather vulgar sort of theft, I could not help saying, and to this, my single protest, Raffles instantly assented. It is a vulgar sort, said he, but I can't help that. We're getting vulgarly hard up, and there's an end on it. Besides, these people deserve it and can afford it. And don't you run away with the idea that all will be plain sailing— Nothing will be easier than getting some stuff, and nothing harder than avoiding all suspicion, as of course we must. We may come away with no more than a good working plan of the premises. Who knows? In any case, there's weeks of thinking in it for you and me. But with those weeks I will not weary you further than by remarking that the thinking was done entirely by Raffles, who did not always trouble to communicate his thoughts to me. His reticence, however, was no longer an irritant. I began to accept it as a necessary convention of these little enterprises. And after our last adventure of the kind, more especially after its denouement, my trust in Raffles was much too solid to be shaken by a want of trust in me, which I still believe to have been more the instinct of the criminal than the judgment of the man. It was on Monday the 10th of August that we were due at Milchester Abbey, Dorset, and the beginning of the month found us cruising about that very county, with fly-rods actually in our hands. The idea was that we should acquire at once a local reputation as decent fishermen, and some knowledge of the countryside, with a view to further and more deliberate operations in the event of an unprofitable week. There was another idea which Raffles kept to himself until he had got me down there. Then one day he produced a cricket ball in a meadow we were crossing, and threw me catches for an hour together. More hours he spent in bowling to me on the nearest green, and, if I was never a cricketer, 
At least I came nearer to being one by the end of that week than ever before or since. Incident began early on the Monday. We had sallied forth from a desolate little junction within quite a few miles of Milchester, had been caught in a shower, had run for shelter to a wayside inn. A florid, overdressed man was drinking in the parlor, and I could have sworn it was at the sight of him that Raffles recoiled on the threshold, and afterwards insisted on returning to the station through the rain. He assured me, however, that the odor of stale ale had almost knocked him down, and I had to make what I could of his speculative, downcast eyes and knitted brow. Milchester Abbey is a grey, quadrangle pile, deep-set in rich, woody country, and twinkling with triple rows of quaint windows, every one of which seemed a light as we drove up just in time to dress for dinner. The carriage had whirled us under I know not how many triumphal arches in process of construction, and past the tents and flagpoles of a juicy-looking cricket field, on which Raffles undertook to bowl up to his reputation. But the chief signs of festival were within, where we found an enormous house-party assembled, including more persons of pomp, majesty, and dominion than I had ever encountered in one room before. I confess I felt overpowered. Our errand and my own presences combined to rob me of an address upon which I have sometimes plumed myself, and I have a grim recollection of my nervous relief when dinner was at last announced. I little knew what an ordeal it was to prove. I had taken in a much less formidable young lady than might have fallen to my lot. Indeed, I began by blessing my good fortune in this respect. Miss Melouche was merely the rector's daughter, and she had only been asked to make an even number. She informed me of both facts before the soup reached us, and her subsequent conversation was characterized by the same engaging candor. It exposed what was little short of a mania for imparting information. I had simply to listen, to nod, and to be thankful. When I confessed to knowing very few of those present, even by sight, my entertaining companion proceeded to tell me who everybody was, beginning on my left and working conscientiously round to her right. This lasted quite a long time, and really interested me, but a great deal that followed did not and obviously to recapture my unworthy attention, Miss Melouche suddenly asked me, in a sensational whisper, whether I could keep a secret. I said I thought I might, whereupon another question followed, in still lower and more thrilling accents. Are you afraid of burglars? Burglars. I was roused at last. The word stabbed me. I repeated it in horrified query. "'So I've found something to interest you at last,' said Miss Melouche in naive triumph. "'Yes, burglars. But don't speak so loud. It's supposed to be kept a great secret. I really oughtn't to tell you at all.' "'But what is there to tell?' I whispered with satisfactory impatience. "'You promise not to speak of it?' "'Of course. Well, then.' There are burglars in the neighborhood. Have they committed any robberies? Not yet. Then how do you know? They've been seen in the district. Two well-known London thieves. Two. I looked at Raffles. I had done so often during the evening, envying him his high spirits, his iron nerve, his buoyant wit, his perfect ease and self-possession. But now I pitied him. Through all my own terror and consternation, I pitied him as he sat eating and drinking and laughing and talking, without a cloud of fear or of embarrassment on his handsome, taking, daredevil face. I caught up my champagne and emptied the glass. Who has seen them? I then asked calmly. A detective! They were traced down from town a few days ago. They are believed to have designs on the Abbey. But why aren't they run in? Exactly what I asked Papa on the way here this evening. He says there is no warrant out against the men at present, and all that can be done is to watch their movements. Oh, so they are being watched. 
yes, by a detective who is down here on purpose. And I heard Lord Amersteth tell Papa that they have been seen this afternoon at Warbeck Junction. The very place where Raffles and I had been caught in the rain. Our stampede from the inn was now explained. On the other hand, I was no longer to be taken by surprise by anything that my companion might have to tell me, and I succeeded in looking her in the face with a smile. "'This is really quite exciting, Miss Melouche,' said I. "'May I ask how you come to know so much about it?' "'It's Papa,' was the confidential reply. "'Lord Amersteth consulted him, and he consulted me. "'But for goodness' sake, don't let it get about.' I can't think what tempted me to tell you. You may trust me, Miss Melouche. But aren't you frightened? Miss Melouche giggled. Not a bit. They won't come to the rectory. There's nothing for them there. But look round the table. Look at the diamonds. Look at old Lady Melrose's necklace alone. The Dowager Marchioness of Melrose was one of the few persons whom it had been unnecessary to point out to me. She sat on Lord Amersteth's right, flourishing her ear-trumpet and drinking champagne with her usual notorious freedom, as dissipated and kindly a dame as the world has ever seen. It was a necklace of diamonds and sapphires that rose and fell about her ample neck. "'They say it's worth five thousand pounds at least,' continued my companion. Lady Margaret told me so this morning. That's Lady Margaret next to your Mr. Raffles, you know. And the old dear will wear them every night. Think what a haul they would be. No, we don't feel in immediate danger at the rectory. When the ladies rose, Miss Melouche bound me to fresh vows of secrecy and left me, I should think, with some remorse for her indiscretion but more satisfaction at the importance which it had undoubtedly given her in my eyes. The opinion may smack of vanity, though in reality the very springs of conversation reside in that same human, universal itch to thrill the auditor. The peculiarity of Miss Melouche was that she must be thrilling at all costs, and thrilling she had surely been. I spare you my feelings of the next two hours. I tried hard to get a word with Raffles, but again and again I failed. In the dining-room, he and Crowley lit their cigarettes with the same match, and had their heads together all the time. In the drawing-room, I had the mortification of hearing him talk interminable nonsense into the ear-trumpet of Lady Melrose, whom he knew in town. Lastly, in the billiard-room, they had a very great and lengthy pool— while I sat aloof and chafed more than ever in the company of a very serious Scotchman, who had arrived since dinner, and who would talk of nothing but the recent improvements in instantaneous photography. He had not come to play in the matches, he told me, but to obtain for Lord Amersteth such a series of cricket photographs as had never been taken before. Whether as an amateur or a professional photographer I was unable to determine— I remember, however, seeking distraction in little bursts of resolute attention to the conversation of this bore. And so at last the long ordeal ended. Glasses were emptied, men said good night, and I followed Raffles to his room. "'It's all up!' I gasped as he turned up the gas and I shut the door. "'We're being watched. We've been followed down from town. There's a detective here on the spot.' "'How do you know?' asked Raffles, turning upon me quite sharply, but without the least dismay. And I told him how I knew. "'Of course,' I added. "'It was the fellow we saw in the inn this afternoon.' "'The detective,' said Raffles. "'Do you mean to say you don't know a detective when you see one, Bunny?' "'If that wasn't the fellow, which is?' Raffles shook his head. "'to think that you've been talking to him for the last hour in the billiard-room "'and couldn't spot what he was. "'The Scotch photographer!' "'I paused aghast. "'Scotch he is,' said Raffles. "'And photographer he may be. "'He is also Inspector Mackenzie of Scotland Yard, "'the very man I sent the message to that night last April. 
and you couldn't spot who he was for a whole hour. Oh, Bunny, Bunny, you were never built for crime. But, said I, if that was Mackenzie, who was the fellow you bolted from at Warbeck? The man he's watching. But he's watching us. Raffles looked at me with a pitying eye and shook his head again before handing me his open cigarette case. I don't know whether smoking's forbidden in one's bedroom, but you'd better take one of these and stand tight, Bunny, because I'm going to say something offensive. I helped myself with a little laugh. Say what you like, my dear fellow, if it really isn't you and I that Mackenzie's after. Well, then, it isn't, and it couldn't be. And nobody but a born bunny would suppose for a moment that it was. Do you seriously think he would sit there and knowingly watch his man playing pool under his nose? Well, he might. He's a cool hand, Mackenzie. But I'm not cool enough to win a pool under such conditions. At least, I don't think I am. It would be interesting to see. The situation wasn't free from strain as it was, though I knew he wasn't thinking of us. Crowley told me all about it after dinner, you see. And then I'd seen one of the men for myself this afternoon. You thought it was a detective who made me turn tail at that inn. I really don't know why I didn't tell you at the time, but it was just the opposite. That loud, red-faced brute is one of the cleverest thieves in London. And I once had a drink with him and our mutual fence. I was an East Ender from tongue to toe at the moment, but you will understand that I don't run unnecessary risks of recognition by a brute like that. He's not alone, I hear. By no means. There's at least one other man with him, and it's suggested that there may be an accomplice here in the house. Did Lord Crowley tell you so? Crowley and the champagne between them. In confidence, of course, just as your girl told you. But even in confidence, he never let on about Mackenzie. He told me there was a detective in the background, but that was all. Putting him up as a guest is evidently their big secret, to be kept from the other guests because it might offend them, but more particularly from the servants, whom he's here to watch. That's my reading of the situation, Bunny, and you'll agree with me that it's infinitely more interesting than we could have imagined it would prove. But infinitely more difficult for us said I with a sigh of pusillanimous relief. Our hands are tied for this week at all events. Not necessarily, my dear Bunny, though I admit that the chances are against us. Yet I'm not so sure of that either. There are all sorts of possibilities in these three-cornered combinations. Set A to watch B, and he won't have an eye left for C. That's the obvious theory. But then Mackenzie's a very big A. I should be sorry to have any boodle about me with that man in the house. Yet it would be great to nip in between A and B and score off them both at once. It would be worth a risk, Bunny, to do that. It would be worth risking something merely to take on old hands like B and his men at their own old game. Eh, Bunny? That would be something like a match. Gentlemen and players at single wicket by Jove. His eyes were brighter than I had known them for many a day. They shone with the perverted enthusiasm which was roused in him only by the contemplation of some new audacity. He kicked off his shoes and began pacing his room with noiseless rapidity. Not since the night of the old Bohemian dinner to Reuben Rosenthal had Raffles exhibited such excitement in my presence and I was not sorry at the moment to be reminded of the fiasco to which that banquet had been the prelude. "'My dear A.J.,' said I in his very own tone, "'you're far too fond of the uphill game. You will eventually fall a victim to the sporting spirit and nothing else. Take a lesson from our last escape and fly lower as you value our skins. Study the house as much as you like.' But do not go and shove your head into Mackenzie's mouth. My wealth of metaphor brought him to a standstill, with his cigarette between his fingers and a grin beneath his shining eyes. You are quite right, Bunny. I won't. I really won't. 
Yet you saw old Lady Melrose's necklace. I've been wanting it for years. But I'm not going to play the fool. Honor bright I'm not. Yet by Jove to get to windward of the professors and Mackenzie too. It would be a great game, Bunny. It would be a great game. Well, you mustn't play it this week. No, no, I won't. But I wonder how the professors think of going to work. That's what one wants to know. I wonder if they've really got an accomplice in the house. How I wish I knew their game. But it's all right, Bunny. Don't you be jealous. It shall be as you wish. And with that assurance I went off to my own room, and so to bed with an incredibly light heart. I had still enough of the honest man in me to welcome the postponement of our actual felonies, to dread their performance, to deplore their necessity, which is merely another way of stating the too patent fact that I was an incomparably weaker man than Raffles, while every wit is wicked. I had, however, one rather strong point. I possessed the gift of dismissing unpleasant considerations, not intimately connected with the passing moment, entirely from my mind. Through the exercise of this faculty, I had lately been living my frivolous life in town with as much ignoble enjoyment as I had derived from it the year before, and similarly, here at Milchester, in the long-dreaded cricket week, I had, after all, a quite excellent time. It is true that there were other factors in this pleasing disappointment. In the first place, mirabili dictu, there were one or two even greater duffers than I on the Abbey cricket field. Indeed, quite early in the week, when it was of most value to me, I gained considerable kudos for a lucky catch. A ball of which I had merely heard the hum stuck fast in my hand which Lord Amersteth himself grasped in public congratulation. This happy accident was not to be undone even by me, and as nothing succeeds like success, and the constant encouragement of the one great cricketer on the field was in itself an immense stimulus, I actually made a run or two in my very next innings. Miss Melouche said pretty things to me that night at the great ball in honor of Viscount Crowley's majority. She also told me that was the night on which the robbers would assuredly make their raid, and was full of arch tremors when we sat out in the garden, though the entire premises were illuminated all night. Meanwhile, the quiet Scotchman took countless photographs by day, which he developed by night in a dark room admirably situated in the servants' part of the house, and it is my firm belief that only two of his fellow guests knew Mr. Clefane of Dundee, for Inspector Mackenzie of Scotland Yard. The week was to end with a trumpery match on the Saturday, which two or three of us intended abandoning early in order to return to town that night. The match, however, was never played. In the small hours of the Saturday morning a tragedy took place at Milchester Abbey. Let me tell of the thing as I saw and heard it. My room opened upon the central gallery, and was not even on the same floor as that on which Raffles, and I think all the other men, were quartered. I had been put, in fact, into the dressing-room of one of the grand suites, and my two near neighbors were old Lady Melrose and my host and hostess. Now, by the Friday evening the actual festivities were at an end, and for the first time that week I must have been sound asleep since midnight, when all at once I found myself sitting up breathless, a heavy thud had come against my door, and now I heard hard breathing and the dull stamp of muffled feet. "'I've got ye,' muttered a voice. "'It's no use struggling.' It was the Scotch detective, and a new fear turned me cold. There was no reply, but the hard breathing grew harder still, and the muffled feet beat the floor to a quicker measure. In sudden panic I sprang out of bed and flung open my door. A light burnt low on the landing, and by it I could see Mackenzie swaying and staggering in a silent tussle with some powerful adversary. "'Hold this man!' he cried as I appeared. "'Hold the rascal!' But I stood like a fool until the pair of them backed into me, 
when with a deep breath I flung myself on the fellow whose face I had seen at last. He was one of the footmen who waited at table, and no sooner had I pinned him than the detective loosed his hold. Hang on to him, he cried. There's more of them below. And he went leaping down the stairs, as other doors opened and Lord Amersteth and his son appeared simultaneously in their pajamas. At that my man ceased struggling, but I was still holding him when Crowley turned up the gas. "'What the devil's all this?' asked Lord Amersteth, blinking. "'Who was that ran downstairs?' "'Mac... Clefane, said I hastily. "'Aha!' said he, turning to the footman. "'So you're the scoundrel, are you? "'Well done, well done. "'Where was he caught?' I had no idea. "'Here's Lady Melrose's door open,' said Crowley. "'Lady Melrose? Lady Melrose!' "'You forget she's deaf,' said Lord Amersteth. "'Ah, that'll be her maid.' An inner door had opened. Next instant there was a little shriek, and a white figure gesticulated on the threshold. "'Où donc est le crâne de Madame le Marquis?' La fenêtre est ouverte. Il a disparu. Window open and jewel case gone by Jove, exclaimed Lord Amersteth. Mais comment est Madame la Marquise? Est-elle bien? Oui, milor, elle dort. Sleeps through it all, said my lord. She's the only one, then. What made Mackenzie Clefane bolt? young Crowley asked me. Said there were more of them below. Why the devil couldn't you tell us so before? He cried and went leaping downstairs in his turn. He was followed by nearly all the cricketers, who now burst upon the scene in a body, only to desert it for the chase. Raffles was one of them, and I would gladly have been another, had not the footman chosen this moment to hurl me from him, and to make a dash in the direction from which they had come. Lord Amersteth had him in an instant, but the fellow fought desperately, and it took the two of us to drag him downstairs amid a terrified chorus from half-open doors. Eventually we handed him over to two other footmen who appeared with their nightshirts tucked into their trousers, and my host was good enough to compliment me as he led the way outside. "'I thought I heard a shot,' he added. "'Didn't you? I thought I heard three. And out we dashed into the darkness. I remember how the gravel pricked my feet, how the wet grass numbed them as we made for the sound of voices on an outlying lawn. So dark was the night that we were in the cricketer's midst before we saw the shimmer of their pajamas, and then Lord Amersteth almost trod on Mackenzie as he lay prostrate in the dew. "'Who's this?' he cried. "'What on earth's happened?' "'It's Clefane,' said a man who knelt over him. He's got a bullet in him somewhere. Is he alive? Barely. Good God, where's Crowley? Here I am, called a breathless voice. It's no good, you fellows. There's nothing to show which way they've gone. Here's Raffles. He's chucked it, too. And they ran up panting. Well, we've got one of them at all events, muttered Lord Amersteth. The next thing is to get this poor fellow indoors. Take his shoulders, somebody. Now his middle. Join hands under him. All together now. That's the way. Poor fellow. Poor fellow. His name isn't Clefane at all. He's a Scotland Yard detective down here for these very villains. Raffles was the first to express surprise. But he had also been the first to raise the wounded man. Nor had any of them a stronger or more tender hand in the slow procession to the house. In a little we had the senseless man stretched on a sofa in the library, and there, with ice on his wound and brandy in his throat, his eyes opened and his lips moved. Lord Amersteth bent down to catch the words. "'Yes, yes,' said he. "'We've got one of them safe and sound. "'The brute you collared upstairs.' Lord Amersteth bent lower. "'By Jove! Lowered the jewel case out of the window, did he?' and they've got clean away with it. Well, well, 
I only hope we'll be able to pull this good fellow through. He's off again. An hour passed. The sun was rising. It found a dozen young fellows on the settees in the billiard room, drinking whiskey and soda water in their overcoats and pajamas, and still talking excitedly in one breath. A timetable was being passed from hand to hand. The doctor was still in the library. At last the door opened and Lord Amersteth put in his head. "'It isn't hopeless,' said he, "'but it's bad enough. There'll be no cricket today.' Another hour, and most of us were on our way to catch the early train. Between us we filled a compartment almost to suffocation. And still we talked all together of the night's event. And still I was a little hero in my way, for having kept hold of the one ruffian who had been taken. And my gratification was subtle and intense. Raffles watched me under lowered lids. Not a word had we had together. Not a word did we have until we had left the others at Paddington, and were skimming through the streets in a hansom with noiseless tires and a tinkling bell. "'Well, Bunny,' said Raffles, "'so the professors have it, eh?' "'Yes,' said I, "'and I'm jolly glad.' "'That poor Mackenzie has a ball in his chest?' "'That you and I have been on the decent side for once.' He shrugged his shoulders. You're hopeless, Bunny, quite hopeless. I take it you wouldn't have refused your share if the boodle had fallen to us. Yet you positively enjoy coming off second best, for the second time running. I confess, however, that the professor's methods were full of interest to me. I, for one, have probably gained as much in experience as I have lost in other things. That lowering the jewel case out of the window was a very simple and effective expedient. Two of them had been waiting below for it for hours. How do you know? I asked. I saw them from my own window, which was just above the dear old ladies. I was fretting for that necklace in particular when I went up to turn in for our last night, and I happened to look out of my window. In point of fact, I wanted to see whether the one below was open, and whether there was the slightest chance of working the oracle with my sheet for a rope. Of course I took the precaution of turning my light off first, and it was a lucky thing I did. I saw the pros right down below, and they never saw me. I saw a little tiny luminous disk for just an instant, and then again for an instant a few minutes later. Of course I knew what it was for I have my own watch-dial daubed with luminous paint. It makes a lantern of sorts when you can get no better. But these fellows were not using theirs as a lantern. They were under the old lady's window. They were watching the time. The whole thing was arranged with their accomplice inside. Set a thief to catch a thief. In a minute I had guessed what the whole thing proved to be. And you did nothing? I exclaimed. On the contrary, I went downstairs and straight into Lady Melrose's room. You did? Without a moment's hesitation, to save her jewels. And I was prepared to yell as much into her ear-trumpet for all the house to hear. But the dear lady is too deaf and too fond of her dinner to wake easily. Well? She didn't stir. And yet you allowed the professors, as you call them, to take her jewels, case and all? All but this, said Raffles, thrusting his fist into my lap. I would have shown it to you before, but really, old fellow, your face all day has been worth a fortune to the firm. And he opened his fist, to shut it next instant on the bunch of diamonds and of sapphires, that I had last seen encircling the neck of Lady Melrose. End of Gentlemen and Players